Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the third uh, series for the uh, research talks. Uh, today we have Adrian Blackwell and uh, David Fortun, and they will be presenting uh, their uh, work for the Italy trip that will happen uh, in the spring. So just ask them to join. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, to hear about our project and and for the pizza. I'm sure that's part of it too. Uh, I guess I'd start uh, just by saying I don't know how many of the students that are here are aware of the Venice Biennale um, and what it is. So just for context, it's uh, every two years, I guess. Um, uh, there's a process whereby they put out a request for proposals for uh, an official M tree to enter the Venice Biennale representing Canada and around the world. So think about it as an expo uh, for architecture specific, which is in Venice uh, every two years. And then in the off years is the art uh, exhibit. So artists and architecture go back and forth. Uh, Canada started participating in 1952 uh, and then in 1957 they built their own pavilion. So this is a much longer process, even though it opens in May. This starts for us uh, quite a long time ago, actually, uh, in terms of talking to your team and figuring out if, if who's a good fit and then how you're going to get yourselves together. And this is uh, the team that we are a part of that uh, was successful in our bid to represent Canada. So it stands for Architects Against Housing Alienation, and I'll go into that in more detail. This is the name of the group, in a sense, and, and sort of the name of our movement. This is the name of the, the what we're calling a campaign. So traditionally, this is an exhibit, but we're calling it a campaign, which is not for sale, which really comes from uh, what binds our six co-curators together is a belief that the commodification of housing uh, has uh, very deep um, and significant detrimental impacts on our way, on our ability to inhabit our world. Essentially, to feel at home is is at the core of all of our um, research and thinking on this. So that is the collective group on the left: um, Adrian, uh, myself, uh, Matthew Souls, Sarah Stevens, and Tiana Vujasevich. Is uh, they're all from UBC, and then Patrick Reed Stewart, uh, who you might know his name is a, is a practicing Indigenous architect and an adjunct professor at the McEwen School in uh, Laurentian. Now, what you'll see as this unfolds is that that's where it started from. And then this is a Venice Biennale project that just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And we just are very excited about that because what we're talking about is kind of a movement more than a um, uh, sort of an ego driven project. Um, so you'll see we have a graphic designer on the team, Chris Lee. He's a uh, uh, Canadian, but teaches in New York, I believe, or somewhere in the United States. Um, we have a web designer, uh, Ali Kadir, uh, who teaches at OCAD. And then we also have an activist campaign strategist, Vincent Tao in Vancouver. So we try to look at what our assets, what we bring to this research project as academics, and we try to plug in the holes where we're not at our strongest and, and, and strengthen our teams. So again, just for context, this is the Canadian Pavilion in Venice, Italy. Um, it was, like I said, built in 1957 and just in 2018 was retrofitted through a major donation to bring it back to its kind of prior glory. It was sort of falling apart um, and now it's been restored and in great shape. It's at the end of the Giardini. So there are two sections of the Biennale. The Canadian Pavilion is sort of at the long end. Um, and right beside us, there's some views of the water and uh, um, there's a, a canteen right beside us. and then, Landscape that was designed by um, Cornelia um, Oberlander. So um, a lot of great um, Canadian legacy on this site. This is the name of the... Uh, so again, I, I'm not going to go into a huge history. Oh, I guess I can't do this. Oh, there we go. Um, this is the 18th uh, ex ex exhibit, and just so you understand the way that the um, Biennale works, there is one curator for the entire Biennale, and they kind of set the theme, and then there's a committee of people that um, that review all of the work and, and, and curate it. Um, and this year's theme is called The Laboratory of the Future. And I won't go into, into great depths on that, other than to say that our project is a good fit in a sense, because this is meant to be sort of, um, again, an experimental um, 
grounds to question our future collectively uh, in many different ways other than the normal ways we think about architecture. So Leslie Aloko has set the kind of condition or the, the terms for this to to think through things in, in, in more socially and environmentally um, conscious ways. So really the premise for this, I'm going to go through these fairly quickly. I don't think anybody needs to know that um, we have a problem with rising house costs in Canada, and you can see that in uh, recently the numbers uh, dropped, but overall you can see the trajectory. Um, and when you overlap this with wages, um, it's it's a it's a concerning aspect of all of our lives. Um, and affordability is one aspect of this that impacts pretty much every Canadian. Um, but we're really concerned at the people who are basically getting punted out of the system. So, you know, uh, in the past, various people could access housing through various different ways, whether that be social housing, um, you know, um, actual affordable housing. Um, and nowadays we're seeing the numbers for homeless people in Canada um, sort of resilient, unfortunately. So really, that's kind of our focus is to, to think about that. And obviously, Obviously, there's a, 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 an underlying subtext to all of the work is the Indigenous peoples in Canada and thinking about, um, and Adrian will get into this more in a second, but what happens in the process of stealing land from Indigenous people, then parceling it, um, and then putting a price tag onto it. Um, and then the, the First Nations have major crises, um, as well as in the urban setting. So there are a lot of different geographical ranges onto the problems that we're looking at. Bring up Adrian for this part. So we call ourselves um, Architects Against Housing Alienation. So alienation means to be separated from something. So housing alienation means to be separated from your home. It means not feeling at home. Um, so this is a quote from a book that I think is quite interesting, In Defense of Housing by David Madden and Peter Marcuse, and they use the concept of residential alienation. Um, they say that growing numbers of people today do not feel at home in their housing. Overcrowding, displacement, dispossession, homelessness, harassment, disrepair, and other ordeals are increasingly common. Um, there's a term for not feeling at home. It has a long history in social science and critical theory, alienation. But importantly, if something is alienable, it means it's exchangeable. And so housing, the problem of housing alienation is tied to its exchangeability. It can be bought and sold. Alienation is the precondition of all private property. Um, David and I um, co-edited this issue of the journal Scapegoat Architecture, Landscape, Political Economy, um, called Canada, spelt in a very specific way, delineating nation-state capitalism. And th the spelling of Canada is something that we took from the dissertation of our collaborator in AHA, uh, Patrick Reed Stewart. Um, he wrote Canada this way to signify Canada's subdivision, its fracturing, the fracturing of the space into parcels. And within this issue, we were very interested in a tradition in architectural history that comes from a lot of Italian theorists, actually, in the 1950s and 60s, who started to think about how urban morphology was tied to the division of land. And architectural typology was somehow deeply tied to urban morphology. So land division and property in some way were the preconditions and, and structuring devices of architecture itself in this tradition that Aldo Rossi and others were a part of. Um, but, but this tradition was taken up in North America by people like George Baird and Melvin Charney. And this is an example on the left of George Baird's work with his students on the history of Toronto, tracing back the subdivision of land. And what David and I were interested in was the fact that it didn't seem to go back quite far enough. Um, there wasn't really an address. There's magically farmland in the first um, iteration of property. But what happens before that? And how is that farmland actually produced? And Phil Montour um, is a Six Nations land researcher 
at the Six Nations of the Grand River. And he's been working on this problem for just about as long as George Baird from the early 1970s, trying to think about how land is subdivided and what that means for Indigenous people whose land was taken from them. So we tried to think about these things together. And one of the things that we noticed is that there are two interlocked processes of land dispossession, and they're both very architectural. So on the one hand, land dispossession is mapped. So kings and queens proclaim ownership over territory. They draw maps. They subdivide those maps. The subdivision of maps produces property. On the other hand, before people have properly subdivided, settlers settle. And they build architecture. It's a pretty simple form of architecture, but they build buildings. And so these two processes, one that's done by individuals who are making buildings and claiming land through the building, and another abstract process of drawing lines on the land, are two different architectonic processes of land dispossession. So we think that the process of settler colonialism is deeply tied to things that are very close to architectural ways of thinking. And this process of, of making land into property is something that we think of, it has a long history. Of course, Romans had very advanced property laws. But in the modern period, pro modern property emerged not only in Europe, but through the process of settler colonialism. So Europeans were informed by processes that were happening through the contact between settlers and indigenous people. And we looked at books like these. Um, Brenna Bandar's work on the colonial life of property, Alan Greer's work on property and dispossession, and even David Graeber and David Wingrow's work on um, the, the indigenous intellectual roots of the European Enlightenment to argue that not only is Canada ex an exemplar of the housing crisis, but it's also somehow at the foundation of the problem, too. Some of the, the techniques of producing land were produced in the territory that we now call Canada. Um, so fundamentally within our group, we see alienation, housing alienation, as an alienation from three things. From the natural world, from the social communities that people inhabit, and from the creativity that people have to make their own homes. And give this back to David. So early on in this uh, Biennale project, the, one of the first things we looked at was um, how do we talk about housing across Canada? And um, obviously our geography is massive and we couldn't capture it all, but we sort of looked at sort of the epicenters of urban housing problems, which was Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal as our three major urban centers. Um, but then also uh, the prairies uh, and then the, the north. Um, and then all the way out to the East Coast. So those are where the teams are located. The second thing was to ask who should we should collaborate with if we were to tell this story. And uh, very early on, we came up with a strategy that included um, that architects on our own are not very useful in the housing crisis, um, but nor are other pieces. But architects play a central role, but only in our way to work with our colleagues. So. We also work with activists um, and then an advocate. And the advocate is sort of a blurry term that we're using for people that are supportive of the housing um, initiatives. Um, many of them are academics, but others are, are individuals and, and other kind of groups of people. So it's within this team of three um, that uh, each one of those geographical regions have representation. So I'm gonna run through these uh, fairly quickly. Um, the other aspect of this that we decided is we didn't want to just raise noise about housing because there's a lot of noise about housing, but we wanted to have a strategic end game, which was demands. So each one of these 10 teams, their first task was um, to uh, develop their own demand on what can improve their housing situation given their context. Um, and beyond the Biennale, the idea is that the campaign will continue. Uh, we are pushing for actual real change in each one of these cases. So uh, should I run through all the names, do you think, Adrian? Yeah, OK. So anyways, those, those are the 10 teams. And you can see the breakdown of the three different groups. Um, and here's sort of how the demands were laid out to them. So we, we talked about a short word national demand 
um, then a kind of a longer elaboration and then uh, an expansion of that. Um, and this helped all the teams even clarify what it is that they were seeking um, in their own demands. Um, uh, and then the project would develop uh, from that demand. So it would come with a financial and policy framework, thinking about uh, how policy changes could um, build a specific form of affordable housing. Um, it involved a campaign strategy. So how do we um, spread the word about this to demand change? Uh, and an architectural design strategy. So what is the architectural outcome of this? Um, again, here are all of the demands, and I'm going to go through these one by one again, but essentially our manifesto as a, as a collective is to decommodify housing in Canada, we demand. So really our manifesto are the 10 demands of the 10 teams. And that's how they kind of again map out as a group. One campaign, one manifesto, we see it, even though like it's broken down into all these different categories. So this is from the, the placeholder of our website, which is up and running. So when you come to AHA's website, this is what you see, which is consistent with our idea that this is really about the demands. And there you see to de decommodify housing in Canada, we demand, and we'll run through these um, sequentially um, in no real particular order. But uh, the West Coast group, which is led by Patrick Stewart, architect, he's a NISCA architect, as well as uh, the hereditary chief uh, of the Squamish nation, I believe can't remember now which First Nation, but Ian Campbell. Um, and then Sarah Silva is their advocate, who's a, an Indigenous housing advocate. And their simple uh, demand is land back, um, which at first we were kind of thinking, how do you define that? And then we thought actually in its... Oh, is there? Oh, okay, this has been added. So this is new to me. I haven't seen this before yet. So... Um, um, you can look at this map of Canada from the circumpolar north um, and look at uh, what's crown land, which is kind of surprising when you think of Canada in this terms right now. We would think that a lot of Canada is owned by private property, but the vast majority of it is crown land and their demand is basically crown land means indigenous land. So if you think about that as a thought of Canada moving forward, uh, it's a very different country. Uh, the second uh, demand is on the land housing. Uh, this is coming from the Northern team. And uh, this idea, uh, so this team is really focused on unsheltered Indigenous women across Canada. There's a bit of a crisis, um, and we, we've learned a lot about this. For instance, that a lot of homeless women um, end up on the street streets by getting out of uh bad relationships essentially harmful relationships um so there's a there's a, a gender imbalance in terms of uh homelessness and particularly for indigenous women so uh this is uh our our collaborator is katlia lafferty who's an advocate and a law student out on the west coast um and this picture of her uh in on the land in northwest territories and what they're looking at doing is basically empowering Indigenous women by providing shelters on the land. So rather than being kind of lost in Yellowknife, you can sort of get on a bus and go and there'll be people that uh, let you live back on the land, learning the old ways of, of being with the land. A lot of the talk of this, crew, of this group particularly talked about that there is no such thing as homelessness because the land is your home. And as long as you're on your on your land, you should feel at home. It's just that a lot of people have lost touch with that. Um, so the idea here is that there's going to be a land-based um, camp, basically, for empowering women uh, to, to restore their sense of home on the land. Um, and these are just some of the images and photos that Catley has provided, which we think are just so beautiful and inspiring. And these are done by non-architects, but sort of talk about what the vision is of a communal group of people around the fire um, on the land. The next group uh, are uh, First Nations Home Building Lodges, and um, this is the group that my my firm is leading, um, and Matthew's here, who worked as a co-op student with us on that. So uh, Matthew uh, from from the school here has been a part of this, uh, and really what we're doing with this one, we we look at what's been happening on reserves is essentially housing has been pitched as a commodity, almost like nowhere else, because the federal government, even though there's a long waiting list for number of homes, they say here's your amount of money you can build houses with 
and you can maybe build three a year, even though your waiting list is 150. And most communities say, well, we want to stretch that to five. So they get plans from home hardware and people from off reserve come and build those houses on reserve because they're trying to stretch their dollar as far as they can. How has that helped the community in any way in terms of building skills, um, even using their own materials? You can't you can't use the wood from your First Nation. I don't know if a lot of you know that, but you can't use lumber from your First Nation because it has to be stamped through process. So there's all these colonial mechanisms. So we're looking at basically this idea of uh, moving towards self-determination on housing, even through manufacturing and funding what we're calling a home building design lodge. Um, which is linked to a manufacturing facility. But the idea here is to have community-led housing in their language, um, using their materials, um, and and sort of redirect housing to a much more um, uh, community-led project. So the other thing that I'll just share with you, and I've shared in a few lectures, is that we're working with the One House Many Nations, which is the Idle No More branch of Idle No More. And um, this is our design lodge project. Um, and... Uh, one of the things that comes out of this is this idea of housing as a cosmology. I just mentioned this to, to Rick and, and the students the, the other week. So the constellations are part of housing, and I won't go into that, but this is uh, at the core of what we're doing. Um, next is intentional communities for unhoused people. And this is a group uh, actually from us locally. This includes uh, Better Tent City from the Kitchener-Waterloo area. Um, SVN architects and planners and Toronto tiny shelters and basically this is looking at this idea of the gap between living rough on the street um, or in self-made encampments um, and instead gaining access to long-term housing so they're looking at cities using underutilized land to fund and build intentional communities where residents receive services share community responsibilities and regain agency to govern the space in their lives so here you see their diagrams uh, outlining the idea of the encampment, 24-hour um, respite, and then a shelter situation. And then there's this kind of idea that you can move along to housing. There's a strategy there to get people housed in, in, in a dignified way. I won't go into this in any um, uh, detail, but um, here the idea is that you're working with cabin community workers and designers to secure location in a cabin community. Um, so they're going through a series of these evocative diagrams to say, how can you, for instance, use parking lots? And they're really pushing forward on this, actually trying to get traction on this um, and look at an architectural solution whereby the components can be additive um, and incremental um, and, and this idea of creating community. So all the teams sort of have these sorts of diagrams that are outlining their specific approach on how they relate to the communities, um, who's benefiting, who's contributing to these sorts of things. And I'm just going to go through these and call Adrian up for the next one. So David's David's just shown the first of the of three Toronto teams. The second one, um, reparative planning, is working in um, Little Jamaica along Eglinton, and they're arguing that um, black residents of Little Jamaica who have been displaced have a right to return, and they need funding to to build a land trust that will accommodate both housing and commercial space in Little, Little Jamaica. So the team includes um, Studio for Contemporary Architecture, SOCA, uh, CP Planning, and uh, Black Urbanism Toronto, and Keel Eglinton residents. So there are actually four, there's one extra group in this group. Um, but what um, SOCA has been thinking about is thinking about both the Main Street guidelines in the City of Toronto and the Missing Middle guidelines, and trying to tweak both of them to produce a different kind of urban fabric. So they imagine the, the project taking scattered sites along Eglinton, but also deeper into the fabric on either side of Eglinton, and filling out over time. Um, they think of a different way of developing Eglinton. So the Main Street strategy in the City of Toronto tends to take ask developers to assemble numerous lots, tear down the existing retail, build large buildings, inevitably with very large commercial spaces. And so what they want to do is think about much more lot by lot development so that existing commercial is valued in, um, in redevelopment schemes. 
Um, but they also imagine really activating the lane behind Eglinton, um, which is already called Reggae Lane, but they imagine it as something that could have commercial. And they imagine commercial interspersed within the missing middle. So missing middle, I don't know if you're familiar with that concept, but it's a pretty hot topic in planning discourses today, which is basically densifying, uh, finding ways to densify what in Toronto is called the yellow belt or residential fabrics. And so they want to densify, but they want to do it also by mixing uses. They're working um, actively with community residents um, to develop this vision through CP planning, Buto, and Keel Eglinton residents. Um, this, the third group in Toronto is working on the unearned imp increment or a gentrification tax. So this group argues that when properties are sold, there is an increment of the value which is not generated by the owner of the property, but is generated by the surrounding community. So this is a very old idea, one that was developed in the 19th century by Henry, Henry George and even before that by other liberal thinkers. But the idea is that there should be a tax that takes that um, unearned increment and funnels it back into deeply affordable housing. So here we have a diagram of a real estate investment trust and a land trust. And what are the differences in terms of affordability? And so in, in Parkdale, where this is cited, um, real estate investment trusts have bought up all, a lot of the apartment buildings. And when they buy them, they make a profit by increasing rents. And so their primary objective is to evict people and raise rents. So they work very hard to displace, destabilize residents. Community land trusts have exactly the opposite function. They secure the tenure of housing. But we imagine looking first at all the existing taxes in the city of Toronto and thinking about how a uh, tax could be placed on the increase in the value of a property declining over time to disincentivize quick speculation and flipping. Um, and uh, gentrification tax action, which is an group of artists really um, that I participate in um, is trying to explain to people that everybody generates value and that the value that they generate needs to be reinvested locally. Um, Levitt Goodman architects are the architects. I miss something. No, I feel like I missed a slide here. I think I did, but anyway, they're, they're working on one of the buildings along Jamison Avenue. There's a whole series of 10 to 15 story apartment buildings, and they're looking at building on the front of the building and building on the roof of the building as a way of expanding to create, take a real estate investment trust building and turn it into a land trust building. Um, so surplus properties for housing is in Halifax. And they've, first of all, are working with a group called This Should Be Housing to locate existing surplus government sites within the city of Halifax. Um, they're also looking at where can we find funding from different sources to create housing affordability. So they've kind of pieced together through a whole set of different programs the funding to produce affordability. And they're looking at the, the trajectory of land, existing trajectories of land in the suburbs of Dartmouth, um, and looking at an alternative future for that where they can imagine um, – low to mid-rise housing that integrates um, existing public assets. There's an arena on this site that would turn into a public building surrounded by a mosaic of different housing uses. Um, on back, jumping back across the country to the West Coast, there's a group called Collective Ownership, arguing for collective ownership, but they see themselves as combining models of co-housing, co-op housing, and co-living to create a co-op in Richmond. Um, they're producing a manual to, to explain this, but basically they're, they want to change legislative structures and financial structures to incentivize this kind of cooperative. And they're doing it in a community which is substantively Chinese, um, and, but they're thinking about how can this co-living situation create a wonderful place and value for all the different residents of this new community. And in Montreal, there are two groups. I think we're finishing with them. Mutual Aid Housing um, is working right in the downtown of the city of Montreal. And they're, they're interested in producing very dense housing um, in, in the urban core. Today, um, affordable housing tends to be on suburban smaller sites, um, but they are demanding central urban housing for um, immigrants um, that have uh, cultural programs embedded within them so that um, they're creating a kind of uh, resonance between 
uh, public cultural programs and social housing. And they're creating a kind of a very dense space with multiple levels with public programs afraid. And the final group in Montreal is Ambient Ecosystems Commons, which is, sorry, I didn't mention the last group was, I'm not mentioning the, all the teams, but that was Atelier Big City um, with uh, Ipec Torelli and I forget the activist group in Mutual Aid Housing. But Ambient Ecosystems Commons is um, Luf Architects and um, Batille Sans Cartier, which is a nonprofit housing organization. And a third organization, which is like the ecological municipal activist group, I'm forgetting the name of it, but they demand an ambient ecosystems charter for urban housing. So really what they're interested in is not simply the housing, but that housing needs an environment in which it subsists. So they, they're, I guess, most interested in the way that housing is disconnected from its ecological milieu. And they're trying to think about marginal um, ecosystems that could be amplified and maintained as common spaces around dense urban housing and in relation to private and public services. So they see these, these yellow spaces here, but green spaces and other images as spaces of social cohesion and um, ecosystem services. And they've provided a kind of um, storyboard of the steps required, both demanding things from the government, but also occupying land immediately and this is something which has a long history in toronto in in, in montreal not in toronto um, but where even things like the alleyways in montreal are already taken over by residents so they're building on that kind of a movement david hey we're just wrapping up here just to share a bit more about it and again what i said earlier that even though this is an exhibit traditionally we're thinking of this more of a campaign which means that we're encouraging everybody to uh those of you that are active on social media to follow us um because in order for us to gain the kind of public awareness that we're hoping to we knew we had to embark on a social media campaign and none of the six of us <laughs> are very active on social media so that provided some challenges but we figured that out we have a we're working with TikTok, um which recently in the news is not didn't turn out that great of a choice but um we're working with TikTok and um instagram so i just want to pause it there and if everybody who's interested and is active on social media can add aha to their instagram or TikTok accounts um, and then that's our website which is pretty straightforward aha.ca um, and these will evolve throughout the uh the the biennale the other thing that we're going to be doing during the Biennale is actually within the physical spaces of Canada, um, a number of uh, campaign activities, including a poster um, campaign. So in urban centers, we will be putting up some of these with QR codes to allow people on the street to engage with uh, some of these demands and, and the challenges that, that are being faced in that region. And this is the design of the um, pavilion itself. Um, so uh, the core design uh, team on this are Adrian and Matthew, but we've all been working alongside them on this. Um, and you can see the upper level is actually the campaign headquarters in a sense that there will be students working there throughout the, the Biennale um, in support of the 10 demands. So students will be working with the activists and, and the teams on how we push these demands uh, forward to, to get to be met. Uh, underneath the mezzanine level, then there are these wood stud walls where we have all the different 10 teams projects. Um, and then in the back, you can see there's like bookshelves and some meeting spaces and then large scale images on the back wall that that speak to all the projects. And there's been a very interesting conversation throughout to say, how do you design an exhibit to look and feel like a campaign office without over curating it, but having to curate it? So that's been an interesting one. Um, and I don't know if you just want me to summarize that or do you want to, yeah, I guess Adrian should better come up and. Yeah, so as part of the campaign, um, David's already mentioned, there will be 15 students in Venice for the duration of the campaign. Um, in the summertime, there will be 15 UBC students. In the fall, there will be 15 Waterloo students. Um, the Waterloo students will be, will be there as part of a full 3B term. So students who are currently in 3A can apply 
to go to Venice to be part of this program. So the program will involve a studio. Um, you know, just move. Um, so a, a standard studio course. The studio course will be focused on the campaign itself. We, Matthew and I are trying to work this out together because Matthew is working with the UBC students. And they have a slightly different curriculum, but we want the programs to be quite similar in some ways. But the studio will not be a conventional design studio, but it'll be more of a research and campaign studio. So students will be assigned different demands and you'll be working on those specific demands and developing research that deepens and helps to realize those demands. So you'll also be working closely with um, the teams that have worked on those demands. So if you're assigned to home building lodges, you'll be in contact with David and Lancelot and Sean and people with I don't know more, et cetera, um, as a way of um, understanding the context and working with them to deepen the demands. Um, the, the other two courses will be related. Con contemporary architecture theory is not entirely clear. I'm going to be teaching the studio and I'll be teaching the elective. I probably will be teaching contemporary architecture theory as well, but it may be tied to the to the one that's being taught here. Um, there may be a remote version. We're not we haven't quite worked out how to do contemporary architecture theory, but it will be offered. Um, and it may if it's if I'm teaching it, it might be slightly inflected towards housing. But um, the elective definitely will have to do with the biennial and will have to do with housing. Um, so anyone who's in 3A or anybody else who's going into 3B um, is eligible for this opportunity. Um, so the anticipated costs, a flight is roughly $1,000 plus or minus. You can get them right now for um, seven something. Um, living expenses obviously are variable. Um, we have a confirmed contract that we haven't signed yet because we don't have any students yet, but we have a confirmed price um, for housing, which is not cheap. It's $8.55 a month um, for shared accommodation, but it's kind of a nice thing to have it in place. So that's what we're thinking we're going to do. And so we, we are fundraising for this project. So there will be funding for students. Um, it will not cover $5,000. We're not able to get the funding that high, um, but it will subsidize um, and we're hoping it will pay your flight and it will subsidize accommodation such that accommodation could be lower than it is here. Um, so it shouldn't be a large expense over being a student in, um, in Galt. So, um, at the moment, we have 1500 per student. Um, some of that may be a payment for being a gallery attendant. So one of the things we don't want you to do, be a gallery attendant as a student, obviously. It's not a um, education. It's not directly related to your coursework. But we do think having student activists engaged in the campaign, working with the public, will be really beneficial to everybody. So we'd like to pay the students to be involved. Um, and there's going to be an application process. So we'll be sending out something to the 3A class and any eligible students. Um, and you can submit a CV portfolio and answer this questionnaire. And we'll be selecting 15 students um, to go based on that. And obviously, we want everybody to apply. Um, we would like you to apply regardless of whether you feel um, if you if you're worried about the costs, apply anyway. We really want to try to make sure everybody is able to go. And so we will be reaching out to individuals and trying to understand the cost burdens and developing a way that we subsidize um, so that everybody who um, wants to go is able to go. Uh, 